Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And once again this week, I'm going to be giving you my three biggest takeaways from yet another MixCon masterclass. This one is coming up on Monday with Jakir King. Jakir King, really cool dude. If you haven't heard of him, he has won, I think, at least three Grammys. He's worked with Tom Waits, one of my all-time favorites, Kings of Leon, Shania Twain, Nora Jones, Modest Mouse, Buddy Guy, City in Color. The list goes on and on. A whole bunch of tremendous mm-hmm. stuff. And Jakir's a tremendous guy. He is great at recording, production, and mixing. And there are three key insights from this masterclass that I just think are huge takeaways. And my biggest takeaway is that almost every single piece of advice he gives in, my, in that masterclass parallels the advice that I give in my full-length course, Mixing Breakthroughs. And this will be like a quick look at pretty much the structure of what Mixing Breakthroughs is about because his process is almost identical to what I describe in there. And I'll give you the reasons for why it is too. So I I think you're going to get a great framework for mixing and how to approach it out of his masterclass. And today is the Cliff's Notes notes version of it. If you don't have two hours to spend with Jakir going under the hood of a real mix, I think you should definitely check it out. It's sponsored by Universal Audio. He actually does the whole mix inside of Luna, but it's great no matter what DAW you are on. Before we get into these three major takeaways, I am going to give the briefest of uh, shout outs to this week's sponsors. Number one, Sound Toys sponsoring this podcast since the beginning. Check out any of the creative effects they make for free over at soundtoys.com. We actually just had a Sound Toys workshop for MixCon on the channel, so make sure you check that out with Mitch Thomas. It was a ton of fun. Also, a uh, sponsor for this week, Steinberg, makers of WaveLab, Nuendo, Dorico, Cubase, some of the most powerful and flexible software out there, whether you're looking to do music notation stuff, mastering stuff, DAW stuff, they make great stuff. All right, let's dive right in. Three big takeaways from Jakir King. Number one is Jakir tries to get the mix right before he even starts mixing. And this is what he starts his masterclass out talking about and showing off is that so many of the sounds that he wants as final sounds, he's getting at the recording and production stages of the process. So his mixing approach can actually end up feeling a bit minimal because he's making what most people would consider mixed decisions while he is actually recording, while he is actually tracking. Now, you don't always have the luxury of doing this, particularly if you're working on projects, mixing projects that other people have recorded, but you can still take some of the ideas from that part of his presentation into account. But coming away with that idea, if you do do recording, if you do do production, of baking in sounds right then and there, making mixed decisions in the recording, in the production. To be able to do that, you've got to have a monitoring environment you can trust, and you've got to have the ability to follow your gut, follow your instincts, and you've got to have some taste that you've developed by listening to a lot of other recordings, by trying a lot of things, by trying them specifically in your space that you're going to be monitoring in. But that's a big thing, and he's not afraid to, and it would encourage you not to be afraid to, print effects, printing an outboard reverb or delay or you know effect pedal, printing with EQ, potentially printing with compression, those kinds of things. Getting the mix as good as possible before you even start mixing. So the mix becomes more and more like a formality, ideally. And that's the ideal. Obviously, it's not always the way that it goes, but that's what you can be shooting on. So that's the one big takeaway, is the mix starts before the mix. We actually had a presentation a few years back, I think it was maybe MixCon 2015 or 2016, with Nick Hard, who cracked open a snarky puppy track for us, and the presentation was entitled, The Mix Starts With The Mics. And he focused a lot on mic placement being a big part of the mix. And Jakir brings that up too. The last thing I'm going to say on this point before moving to big takeaway number two is that some of the feedback we get on our second most popular MixCon video with Mick Gazowski. He was mixing a Jamiroquai track uh, at MixCon. Is that people heard this mix that Mick Gazowski did and they would say, oh, well, it already sounded great when he got the tracks. No wonder the mix sounds great. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if that's something you take away from some of these mix walkthroughs, then good. If you take away, wow, my recordings hopefully should sound at least at this level, and they're only at this level. Maybe that's where I need to work on my mixing. In the recording is in the production. And if that's one of your big takeaways that some of these phenomenal sounding tracks sound phenomenal before they hit the mix stage, that's an important and valuable insight to have. And it's not something you should discount. 
And it's something you can achieve in your own studio, no matter how modest it is. You can make decisions that are good on the way in, in a modest environment, in a decent room with some decent panels on the wall, with a couple of decent microphones and a decent interface. You can make decisions on the way in that matter. All right, thing number two, so I don't spend the entire day just talking about this, which I could, is that Jakir mixes almost backwards from what most people would expect. And this is where it gets into talking about mixing breakthroughs, and this being the framework that I recommend for a lot of people in mixing breakthroughs. Jakir starts with two things. He starts with one, getting the level balances right. And that's the most important and often overlooked and forgotten part of the mix, the mixing part of mixing, (laughs) getting balances. That is the most crucial thing, and it wants to be done first. And it wants to be done before you go in, start playing around with individual tracks. So he does that balancing portion first. And then immediately, as soon as there's a decent balance going, he starts with bus processing. And this is the working backwards part. That's the inverse of what a lot of people expect. And it's what exactly what I recommend in mixing breakthroughs is that you should, after getting a balance or starting to get a balance, very quickly put on a bus compressor if you're going to use one. If you're going to be using master bus EQ, it's a good idea to put on early rather than later. Um, If you're going to be using some kind of saturation, tape simulation, maybe even a very gentle peak stop limiter on the master bus, that's when you should be doing it, right in the beginning, either as soon as you've done balances or as you're getting near the end of getting balances, because you want to mix through those things. That's number one, because if you put them on after, it's going to change things that you've done. And number two, because it makes you less inclined to go in on a track-by-track basis and try noodling around and tweaking on every single little individual track. Because often, just getting some excitement going with a little bit of compression, just getting a little bit more clarity going and a little bit more control going with maybe a tiny bit of EQ on the mix bus, just getting a little bit more cohesion with maybe a little bit of tape simulator or saturator on the mix bus, that kind of thing, does so much of what you're looking to do on an individual track-by-track basis. And you can just do it once and affect everything. And then you're mixing through that. So instead of going in and boosting a little bit of 5K on everything or a little bit of 8K on everything or cutting some 4K on everything like individually, you do it once. And then once you've done that, the next thing Jakir does is he goes back and looks at his buses. So after his main mix bus, he'd be then looking at, say, the drum bus, the bass bus, the keyboard bus, the vocal bus, and doing global treatments on those things. A little bit of a compression across an entire instrument group, a little bit of an EQ across an entire instrument group, et cetera, et cetera. And then only after he's done that basic bus processing that kind of heightens everything, brings them to life, and makes the balance just speak more, only then are we going in individually on a track-by-track basis to evaluate things. And I think that's an important way of working because it keeps you from getting bogged down with the way that most people start mixing is they go with like, hey, let's open up the kick drum. It's the first track. Now I'm going to spend an hour on the kick drum. Okay, I think the kick drum sounds about as good as you can make a kick drum. Now let's go on to the snare. Oh my goodness. That's how I started. That's how so many people start. And I don't want to say it's wrong because people can get results that way, but it's not necessarily the fastest, most intuitive, most surefire, most quick, most enjoyable way to getting a great mix. You start backwards almost with your buses get a good overall vibe, and then go back to tweak little things, you find yourself doing so much less tweaking than you otherwise would have, and you find yourself spending so much less time than you otherwise would have. So the third big key takeaway I want to give you about Jakir's process is, since in particular with this one, he's mixing something that was already mixed um, while he was recording it in the sense that he's making production decisions while it's going in. He's not doing a ton of EQ on each track in the mix because a lot of those decisions were made, right? Instead of using an EQ, let's, you know, change to a different guitar, change to a different mic. So there's not a ton of little individual track things going on to make things fit better because they were already recorded to fit. And of course, he gives a caveat that if he's mixing other people's stuff, he might have to do significantly more of that if it wasn't recorded in that way. Like, you should have recorded with a brighter guitar part. We're going to have to do that with EQ. And we're going to do that having already established all this stuff. But I do want to say that the last thing here is he thinks about overall tonal balance a lot. And he thinks about almost mastering engineering kind of things in the mix. 
that he is looking at the overall tilt of things on those buses, and he's looking at that on the individual tracks. You know, cleaning up and tightening up a little bit of low end on some individual tracks. Just bringing out a little bit of extra articulation on some of these individual tracks. Not necessarily to make it poke out more so than another track, because you can do that to a degree with faders and level, but to get things to an appropriate overall balance. And I think that's another big thing is to develop the confidence and the ability to hear what's going on in your room where you can make mastering like decisions about the overall tonal balance of your entire mix and the individual tracks within it. And that comes down to just getting halfway decent monitoring. And the overlooked parts here are a little bit of room treatment in your room, good speaker positioning, and maybe some type of corrective EQ on your speakers. And we have tons of videos about how to go about that here in the Sonics Group channel. But that's a big thing, is if you can make sure that you can trust what you're hearing and then hear a lot of other great records in that environment, you can start making those decisions. So I thought that was a cool thing, that he's making mixed decisions while recording and to some degree mastering like decisions while mixing. And of course, it does go off to a final mastering engineer. He's a big proponent of that. He wants a third-party independent QC of his work that's going to do an additional layer of sweetening and thinking really about the global macro stuff where he is mostly focused on making sure that the mix relationships are right, focusing on the internal balances. That's the big thing you're focusing on the mix, the internal balances. Is the snare loud enough? Is the vocal loud enough? Is this tambourine too loud? Because those things are hard to address in mastering. So he's not focusing just on the tonal balance. He's focusing on those mix things first and foremost, but he's not afraid to make some decisions in that direction so he doesn't overwork individual elements in the mix. These things that Jakir brought up, man, they are habits that I think anyone can integrate into their workflow. And they are common themes that I find again and again when I study some of the best mixers out there. And they are in the free workshop that we have for you, the five habits of truly great mixers that you can get at sonicscoop.com slash mix habits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mix habits for the five habits of truly great mixers. Some of the ideas that we've just discussed are in there, but also like three or four other ideas that we haven't touched on today. So there's even more in that free workshop. Check it out. And if you want a full length course that really goes into the idea of mixing in this way and with some of this mindset in there, uh, mixing breakthroughs with my full length course where there's just so much in parallel between the way Jakir does it and the way I explain in that course, which is what I've gleaned from studying people like Jakir from the past 10 years and the way they do it, wanting to learn how to do this better myself. So I hope that stuff's useful for you. I hope Jakir's workshop, his masterclass is a good one for you. It's the longest one we've put out yet for a mix con. It's uh, between an hour and a half and two hours, but uh, it's a great one. You get to hear each individual track in there and you just get to absorb some of his insight, some of his wisdom, some of his confidence, some of his attitude, some of his approach. And uh, I think it's a good massaging and washing of your brain with good ideas like all of these mix cons are. So thanks for joining me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Big shout out to our sponsors. I want to mention Universal Audio because they sponsored uh, Jakir's thing. It's coming out on Monday. Definitely check it out. Followed by a live Q&A after the live premiere of his MixCon Masterclass. Uh, sponsors for the podcast uh, this week are Soundtoys, sponsoring this from the beginning. Try out anything they make for free over at Soundtoys.com. Does Jakir use Soundtoys plugins in his mix? Yes, he does. Pretty much everyone, <laughs> whoever comes and does MixCon, uses Soundtoys plugins uh, in their mix for a reason. You probably should be too. So check out anything they make for free at Soundtoys.com. They give you a fully functional 30-day trial. I think you should just buy the whole bundle. It's great. Uh, also, Steinberg, makers of some killer DAWs and software like the Notation Program, Dorico, the Mastering Platform, WaveLab, the extremely powerful and forward-looking DAWs, Cubase, and Nuendo. Definitely check those guys out at steinberg.net. If you want the five habits of truly great mixers absolutely for free, go to sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. If you're looking for a full-length course that has a lot to do with the way that Jakir thinks about these things, definitely check out Mixing Breakthroughs at mixingbreakthroughs.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.